Have you ever wondered how to improve your story? Well, I'm here to interview author extraordinaire Jacob. He's going to give you three, not two, but three special tips on how to make your story an instant hit. So Jacob, how does one do this? You keep it simple. And you keep it simple. That's, that's two, Jacob. I, the I third is that you keep it simple. Oh my God, are you serious? That's it? Just yes. keep it simple? Indeed. All right, welcome everyone. We're Semblance of Sanity. I'm Caleb. I'm Jacob. And we're here for a podcast number, number 53. 53. All right, guys, after that ridiculous little intro bit here, <laughs> we're going to be talking about simplicity. Yeah, because that's something that we feel is grossly underrepresented and underappreciated in storytelling, in life in general, but especially storytelling. We're going to keep it simple yes. for this podcast. Yes, but we're also going to break our rule and we're going to talk about in detail why right. simplicity is important, yes. not just in storytelling, but in the individual elements of storytelling, mm -hmm. setting, conflict, characters, plot, and themes. Right. And we're going to draw upon examples of ways that not only has this worked well, but ways in which it actually carries the story mm -hmm. to greater yep. heights than it could have if it went for a more ambitious or complex theme. Right. Now, Jacob, there's a, there's a romanticism, I would say, in storytellers and story writers and story consumers mm -hmm. uh, with regards to complexity. Yes, absolutely. I... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and wouldn't you say that when like when you're first starting out like and you want to make a story, the first story you come at is way more complicated than oh, it needs yeah. to be? Well well, I mean, you know, like like you've worked on stories too, and I'm yeah, sure yeah. many of you guys in our audience have too, but like you want to be Tolkien and like and all of the greats and stuff all at once, so you end up starting the story and you don't really know how it's gonna end, or you're like, Okay, it's gonna end seven books down the road and then there's going to be all these spin off series and prequels and you know, all that and and it's like okay, stop, 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 stop. That's too much, too much of it. Too much of it, darling. Too, darling. Much. too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then there could be that one short story or whatever that just moves you to absolute tears. Mm -hmm. And it's like okay, okay, we need to bring that back. We need to make that more cool again. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's one of the reasons a lot of the anime that we rave about so much is because they keep things simple. Yep. Um, yeah, so we're going to get into uh, simplistic detail on that. Right. But before we do, we have to give our VIP shout out to mm -hmm. Savvy Blue yes. on the Discord. One of our Thank newest. you so much for your support. It yeah. means a lot. It really uh, does. It was kind of a funny uh, scenario as to how this person became VIP as yes. well. They were originally a, a $1 supporter, mm -hmm. and it was just like awesome having them on the Discord and stuff. And they were like, well, I guess I'm making the jump like all the way to the top. So <laughs> thank you so much. Sploosh. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We're, glad, we're glad to have you. Yeah. Yeah, so... First things first uh, is setting. This yeah. one I kind of particularly want to go in depth into um, because I, I know there's a contradiction there, but <laughs> specifically because I am a fan of fantasy stories. Yes. And fantasy stories are notorious for flubbing this side of things with right. regards to setting being simple. Now I want to call uh, as an example here, a show like Attack on Titan that's lauded as having one of the really immersive worlds mm -hmm. out there. And it does get complicated. And it does get complicated, but for the first part, initially, it is given a very simplistic setting yep. in that everything that we know about the world is through the viewpoint of the main character. Right. So when you have a setting, and say it's a fictional world, you want to like gush about the systems and the cultures and all the different motivations of all these different groups of people mm -hmm. and stuff right at the beginning. And the thing is, is that you can't risk it that in your story like Lord of the Rings does with, you know, five minutes of exposition right. straight in the beginning. Well, and here's one of the other things too. Okay, so uh, a lot of times stories will actually be able to keep things relatively simple at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And simplicity versus originality is a whole nother topic. Totally, right? because, totally. Because with things like Lord of the Rings, a lot of fantasy stories, and in some ways this can be a good thing because it allows you to just get to, to the story you know, right away. Yeah. They'll make this setting very simple. Um, and non-fantasy stories and non-sci-fi stories and stuff where they don't actually create their own world, then the setting is even simpler. Right, like Haikyuu, for instance. Yeah, Haikyuu is one of the ones that has just the simplest setting. It's, <laughs> it's just not even really, really touched on. It's just like, yeah. okay, high school, you know, let's go. But um, but even with, say, like, Attack on Titan, a lot of 
a lot of uh, the people that really got into it in the beginning mm -hmm. ended up kind of having trouble when things got even more complicated and stuff because, okay, now there's all this additional stuff. Whereas at the beginning, those early parts of Attack on Titan, that first core or so, before we started getting into all the wonderful, complicated stuff that's been happening, mm -hmm. a lot of times people look back on that as being basically the highlight mm. of the show. Interesting. Right? Because things were simpler then. Yeah. Um, and that's something that really can't be overlooked. Like, as awesome as it is to have some expansive world where there's all these details and all this stuff, in order for people to be able to get into your story, it mm -hmm. needs to be able to be communicated quickly. Right. Which usually means simplicity. And another thing about setting is that setting is something that very easily can distract from the other tenets of the story if not handled properly. Right. So if you don't trust yourself to handle the setting perfectly, it's mm -hmm. almost a clever kind of reallocation of resources to go, okay, I am worried I'm not going to handle the setting properly. So what I'll do is I'll simplify the setting down yep. so that I can focus on nailing the character aspect right. or the conflict aspect. And this is something that I applaud uh, writers and creators on doing because it makes us aware that, oh, okay, I don't have to pay that much attention to the setting, but I'm noticing that they really want me to pay attention to these characters. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's, let's right. go in on that. And that's something that I think we consume different media for different reasons. Like sometimes sure. you'll go at it and you'll be like, I want to go and consume this bit of media here because the characters in it are handled really well. I'm not really interested in how they do setting or the right. plot. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, absolutely. In that nature. Well, and, and one of the other things too, and this, this goes for all the things that we'll probably say about simplicity in this video, mm -hmm. but your story doesn't have to be simple to be good. Right. Like the, the complicated ones can shine and do their thing. Totally. It's amazing, right? Yeah. But a lot of the times, especially whenever I look at the ones that end up just having the, the widest reach, mm -hmm. and a lot of times people will say that, oh, simplicity means generic and lame and all that mm -hmm. stuff. It doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. Simplicity can be one of the most wonderful, beautiful, amazing things ever. Um, but usually those stories will be very simple in some aspects so that that right. way there aren't a lot of barriers for entry for people to be able to get in and enjoy this wonderful story that you want to tell. Right. And that's, that's a good point to bring up is not all of it is simple. It's mm -hmm. specific areas because right. they know what the writer is maybe good at or what they want to emphasize. Yeah. So moving on to the next bit here, conflict. Conflict is something that I've seen a lot of stories do well actually on the on the side of simplicity. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times it's between like two characters mm -hmm. and it's just right. one interpersonal yep. conflict connection. Yeah. And that's basically the whole story. Mm -hmm. A lot of times that works really well. What I've seen a lot of times happen in stories that try to make things too complicated with regards to conflict is having kind of the the Game of Thrones effect where there's no right. clear protagonist. There's uh -huh. no clear like linear progression for a character overcoming obstacles and then going on to the next right. thing and to the next thing and to the yep. next thing. It's more of like, okay, we've got a spider web of conflicts mm -hmm. going and, on here. And even with something like, say, Game of Thrones, right? That gets real complicated. Oh, yeah. But if you look at what the actual conflict is... yeah. Okay, ice zombies threatening to destroy the world. People want to be king. Those conflicts, you know, are very simple. Yep. Now, when it gets into the details of how each individual yes. person is going to go about trying to make that happen, then it can get a lot more complicated. But usually, whenever they're dealing with one of their many different perspective characters in the narrative that is Game of Thrones, that, that specific narrative, that specific conflict that the character is dealing with mm -hmm. will be very simple. Right. And usually the more more of a, a schemer that the person is, right, that's doing the complicated, like, mastermind level stuff, they usually are not perspective characters. Yes. And if they are the perspective character, usually it won't actually go into the <laughs> details of their mastermind. Right. Like what Tyrion did with the battle at Blackwater. Mm. You, like, I, I don't know, like, I can't remember if it was like this in the show, but, mm -hmm. but with the books... You didn't know what he was doing. He basically just said, build chain links. And that was it. And people are like, what, what are you doing that for? He's just like, do it. And then later when the battle happens, you see it and you're like, oh, awesome. That's what it was. It's fantastic. Yeah, it was but, It was a little bit less vague in the show, but it it was a little bit more built yeah. built upon. But yeah. but it was it was still, still mm -hmm. pretty vague. Another thing with conflict that Jacob brought up here is start your conflict from a simple phrase. And yeah, then extrapolate like from there. Uh -huh. I like how you said ice zombies are going to destroy the world. Yeah. That being the conflict is perfect. Mm -hmm. It's another thing that go, gets at the, the point of concept 
versus right. uh, execution, basically. And, and that's really how you, like, if you're going to tell someone about a story, usually what you'll do is you'll give them your one-sentence summary of the conflict, mm -hmm. whether this yep. is your ed elevator pitch for the story you're making or you're trying to get your best friend to watch this show and, right. and just saying this is my favorite show or something isn't enough, right? Yeah. Usually you have to give them that bit of a bunch of people in medieval times are vying for control of the throne. Right. You know, and then sure. and then if that interests them, then they'll get into the story a bit more. And a lot of times, like like you said, Caleb, this is one of the ones that usually stories that actually end up like making it will be able to keep this part simple. Yes, but they won't necessarily keep it simple and good. It, like yes. like the Marvel villains are a great example of this, where it's like the concept of the conflict is very simple. Bad guy wants to do bad things, but you know that. That's not exactly compelling. You need a, you need a right. little bit more than that. You need a bit more right. attachment. Than it, that. Yeah, it's starting from the communication side mm -hmm. of what the conflict is, you know, based in, and that generally ties directly into the characters, which right. is a nice segue here. Yeah. So for characters, I think that simplicity in characters is just uh, a matter of efficiency. So yes. let's think about it this way. Uh, a, a great way to boil down simplicity in characters is just having a small number of them. Yeah. That's one mm -hmm. way to just keep it easy. That's on one of you. the best ways to do it. It is one of the frankly. best ways to do it. Uh, a small cast is something that's kind of a guilty pleasure. I mean, a large cast is something that's some, like, oh, like, uh -huh. somewhat of a guilty pleasure of mine. Yeah. But when I think back on the best stories that I've experienced, it's generally still going to have a bigger cast, but I don't really care about 70% of the characters. It's the mm. it's that small core group of right. characters that nail their character interactions and relationships yep. perfectly. And one of the ways that you can look at like how the things are kept simple for the sake of the characters, mm -hmm. I would say and this is this is kind of a bad example, but I would say it's also a really good example is if you look at episodic television. Oh, sure. Because what they'll usually do is they'll have a cast from three to five, maybe six main characters, right? <laughs> yeah. And that will be their cast, right? They'll they'll get all the focus. It'll keep things very simple. And mm -hmm. usually their interactions will be pretty simple too. Mm -hmm. And then the banter and, you know, and things like that will be what keep you engaged. Right. But there won't be a lot of, like, crazy interpersonal stuff. Sometimes they'll do that and there are those stories where they do that. But the ones that, like, go for, like, the 20 seasons, you know, and yeah. all that stuff... <laughs> And even if the, the like the plot doesn't necessarily change up episode to episode, they do it because they're able to nail the characters really well mm -hmm. and keep things simple where that's concerned. So right. while it might be fun to be like, I don't want to do just an you know, an episodic serialized type story, there's a lot to learn from those stories. Yeah, there's a lot to learn, especially from the creative side of things, mm -hmm. in that people aren't necessarily um uh, that invested in the character that has the most realistic uh, motivations. Now, this is something that I think gets at a little bit of the oh. viewer psychology here, <laughs> is that sometimes the most appreciated character is not the super complex, multi-layered uh -huh. backstory, three-dimensional, uh, you know, in connections with like a 4D right. chess motivation hybrid thing going on in their background. It's that one caricature character that yep. just owns mm -hmm. their specific shtick right. in the sidelines. Right. And that's fine. The thing, mm -hmm. the thing about this is Simplicity is something that gets their communication across without confusion. Right. One of the things that's real big poison for a character is a character that's confusing. Right. Now, if a character <laughs> is able to communicate what they're about, why they do what they do, and do it well, generally that means that the communication that they utilize to get that message across to the audience is just efficient. They don't right. have a lot of fluff in there. And even like, okay, if you were to take more, uh, a character that is a bit more complicated as far as motivations go or, mm -hmm. or might seem like that, one of my favorite examples of this, or at least the first one that came to mind, is Hisoka from Hunter x Hunter. Sure. Because he is constantly just going all trickster and doing different things, mm -hmm. right? So that the whole guessing of like, okay, what what is his game? Mm -hmm might be a little bit confusing but because his actual motivations are very simple yes he's one of the biggest fan favorites out there like right. because because it's not just that you know he's some static thing or whatever like because that's one of the bad examples of simplicity mm -hmm. but they take a simple thing and then they do simple things with it yeah even though they're different than what you would expect right so yeah uh, specifically in regards to simplicity, the thing I think most stories have the problem with simplicity is the plot. Uh, generally speaking, the stories that go for 
kind of the fantasy sci-fi aspect of things generally uh, have, I would say, the, the most problem. Actually, I'd say most stories in general just have the most problems with the plot trying to sure. get too complicated. And the, I'd say another aspect of this is just the length of the plot mm -hmm. adds to that complexity because it's not actually about the complexity. It's about the contradictions that happen where the plot wasn't consistently carried right. out from the yeah. beginning towards the end. <laughs> yeah, if the devil's in the details, mm -hmm. then just remove the details. Yes, like, like seriously. One of, one of my, okay, we love Disney movies, right? Mm. Disney, I, Disney movies, are just, they're so good. And if you look at like a bunch of the old classics, the story that is actually being told, the, the plot of the story, is insanely simple. Insanely and because of simple. that, a lot of the times these movies would be way shorter than the movies that come out nowadays. They'd be like 80 minutes or something. Or right? 70. Or 70. Like, like if you think about it, that is really short. That's mm -hmm. basically the length of like a Three a anime solid, episodes. Yeah, three anime episodes. Like, yep. imagine a three-episode anime, and that's all you got, yep. right? And <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's crazy to think about, but then these are some of the most beloved stories in like in the world. Right? And it's not necessarily just that the stories are what make them so good. It's all these other things in conjunction with it. Mm -hmm. But I think when we communicate to people that we love this story, people might think, oh, story equals plot. Well, it does and it doesn't. Yeah. So this is this is something that I feel like stories or just media in general help mm -hmm. make things clearer here don't need to go for these super ambitious multi-layered right. plot like you can even look at something like lord of the rings oh and sure. you can boil it down yeah. to simply a bunch of people try to throw some jewelry in a big volcano yep that's that's the plot mm -hmm. now it's not really accurate because right. there's all these other subplots sure. going on here or you could just say medieval fantasy good versus evil well that's that's, that's i think like, more of the setting or, or the conflict yeah or the conflict yeah. yeah yeah but when you get into uh, plots of, I'd say, shorter narratives, you see it being very simple. But there are also stories that I would say lean towards the more episodic type mm -hmm. of thing, where the plot is like Firefly, for instance. Sure. The plot is just people on a ship trying to make means, trying yeah. to make their means yeah. with day-to-day mm -hmm. uh, -day you know, life. Yeah. Day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. That's why I think a lot of the slice of life genre in anime is so popular. Because it's simple because the plot is like almost non-existent mm -hmm. right. in some ways and and you know there 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 are ways to do all these things badly you know oh, don't, yeah. don't get us wrong but like even and and you know cuz complicated stories can be fantastic oh yeah they can be amazing yeah. but but usually i would say simplicity is severely underrated and yes. okay okay hunter hunter all right that is one of the exam one example of a story that does complicated stuff in a, some great ways yeah. right but we watched an episode of that recently that was, you know, basically we found out people have been waiting for us to get to since the very beginning of the show, 116, and that episode is unbelievably simple. Yep. And it's wonderful. Yep. And it's because of the way they set things up mm -hmm. in the, uh, you know, yeah. all throughout the story, you know, thus far. But some people could look at that and go wait, not all of it contributed to that. So you could go, wait a minute, if this story was just about gone, we could have cut out a lot of the other story if, you know, a lot of the culmination was about just simply gone story, but it's not. Right, Hunter exactly. Hunter is, it, Hunter Hunter has it's a lot one of those other, ones other where it does the has, super huge big world and, and all has, that stuff. And has all those other things as right. well. But so, it still keeps it simple when it gets to the characters and stuff. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. So when you have a story and you're trying to design the plot, Start simple. Start simple yep. and hit that part down. A lot of the times when you're talking about these things, you should be able to summarize all of it down to one sentence. Mm -hmm. yep. And I'm not talking about a sentence with five commas. I'm talking like a <laughs> right. short, simple yeah. sentence. Yep, yep, a, um, a natural sentence. Yeah. yeah, and to kind of tie this whole thing up with the bow, the underlying themes of the story mm -hmm. are, in my opinion, of all of these, the most important things yeah. to keep simple. like And the most rarely that it's done. Because yes. like a lot of times themes won't even be given much thought in stories because... Because they're not necessarily, like, they don't have to be there yeah, like if all the time. If like, you're doing just a sort of fun romp story, you can you can do that. You know, and it doesn't need to get, you know, crazy deep or, or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And even for the ones that do, like, 
like for instance, Haiku, right? Yeah. This is one of our favorite examples of just a story that is simple, right? Yeah. All the tenants are, are simple, basically. They'll have mm -hmm. good character, you know, stuff and all that. And the, most of the simplicity is to draw attention to the characters, but then yes. even within the characters, they'll keep things pretty simple. Right. And as far as themes go, it's like, like passion. Yeah. Like, that's about like, it. That's about all you could say. And it's, and like, and some people wouldn't even say that that counts as a theme. Like, right. Right. But, but it's a fantastic show, right? Yeah. So, if you do, if you have themes be complicated, then people basically because themes are, themes is usually a subtle thing, right? That has right. to basically be inferred by the audience and all yes. that stuff. If you make it complicated, then they can lose out on it and be like, was this even intentional or was mm -hmm. this just some sort of accidental thing, right? right? I don't know if this was put here by the author. You lose that connection to your audience by right. making the themes complicated mm -hmm. because the. I would say the main thing about themes that's important is consistency. Right. Now, this is the thing. You can have 15 different themes and consistently showcase yeah. them all. That's very difficult. That's it, very difficult. I'm gonna call example to a do. show that uses a simple, simplistic theme, like, I'm being redundant here, a very <laughs> simplistic theme, but uses it over and over and over and over and over again really well in My Hero Academia. Oh, yeah. And that is, what does it take to be a hero? What does mm -hmm. it mean to be a hero? Yep. Yep. And it constantly asks that question oh, yeah. and answers that question mm -hmm. throughout the story yep. over and over and over again. And so you know anytime they draw attention to that, you're like, oh, this all ties back the whole story together. And you think right back to the very first episodes of the show yep. and you realize that this is why you love it. Right. You know, this is why you watch more and there, My Hero and Academia. I'm sure there are some people out there that don't really care for when My Hero Academia goes into like goes back to their core theme and everything. Right. But the fact that they very simply brought it up in the very beginning, so mm -hmm. they're like, "This is what the show's about." Yep. There's no basically missed expectations. Yep. So if they're enjoying it, they're enjoying it, even though that is the main theme of it. And for the people who do like that theme, yes. they are going to be singing praises for the show for basically now till the end of time because it gives them a promise, a very mm -hmm. simple promise of th yep. this is what the story's about, this is our main theme, mm -hmm. and we're gonna stick to it. Yep. We're not gonna forget it. Yep. And that's it, it's, incredible. It's one of the reasons why, I'm gonna bring up a sore spot with a lot of people, it's one of the reasons why I think a lot of people didn't like The Last Jedi, was The Last oh, Jedi is an sure. example of a subversion of themes Mm -hmm. specifically built up from the previous Star Wars movies. Mm -hmm. And I would say Star Wars is a great example of sticking to Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey right. as a not a, as a plot structure, mm -hmm. but also with regards to the themes that generally come with Joseph Campbell's Hero's yeah. Journey uh, structure. And when we had The Last Jedi, there was a oh huge subversion of themes and yep. plot, of course, but... All sorts of things. All sorts of things. Yeah. And that's not necessarily good or bad, but it definitely riled up a lot of people because yeah. it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We weren't promised this. This mm -hmm. is not consistent right. with Star Wars. Yeah. So when you think back to why should you have themes in the story at all, the main reason why is it builds trust with your audience. Yes. It builds yes. a connection with them so that they go, oh, Oh, okay, this is intentional. The author mm -hmm. put right. this in here I know because it builds fit. upon the themes that they've already set up. Yep. Yep. And another thing that's really cool is you can get into why the author is not only writing this story, but why they're writing specific characters into the story, why they're writing specific plot points into the story. And you go, oh, I see the journey going out here. I want to continue on this journey. Right. And I've seen in a lot of places where a story was a one-off and people are so disappointed because I think they saw uh -huh. the themes, the underlying yep. core stuff oh, yeah. of the story and they're like, no, this is good. You need to yep. make more of this. And and here's something to, to say. Um, simplicity is not easy no, because, no, because naturally not. what we'll want to do is we'll want to build on it, keep building on it, make it more and more complicated. Yep. And if we did have something simple in the beginning, it's very hard to make a full work around a simple theme and keep that consistent throughout the entire story. Yeah. Um, if you can get a more of a one-off type story that mm -hmm. is simple, right, yep. and and does everything nicely and all that, mm -hmm. that is a gem. Yep. And that's oftentimes one of the best ways to determine what you are going to have your story be about and basically use that as a compass mm -hmm. for, for everything after that. Right. Because then 
you have something that's clearly set up of, all right, this is what my story's about. Mm -hmm. So that if people are going to get into the story, they'll be able to see this and be like, I liked that. I yep. want more of that, right? And of yeah. course, it'll be different as the story goes on because you're not just going to be copy pasting it, you know. <laughs> I mean, until the end of time. This is also a place where Hollywood gets a lot of things wrong oh. with sequel baiting, you know? yeah. or not mm -hmm. sequel baiting, just making reboots and sequels of things yep. that shouldn't have gotten them to begin with. There are a lot of stories out there that should have just been a one off, mm -hmm. but because they were successful monetarily, they made a copy paste. I would say aesthetic remake of yeah. the story and without <laughs> promising anything of the themes uh, of the story or keeping the themes consistent right. from the original into the next one. Yeah. Usually what they do is they copy the aesthetic and mm -hmm. that that's fine. The movies yeah. generally like the end plot up, and the settings basically. Right. And, the, and they end up usually being successful. Like people will still enjoy yep. them, but it won't necessarily strike the same chords that the original did because it didn't have the same themes. Exactly. Yeah. So guys, that's our simplicity and storytelling mm -hmm. podcast bit. Yeah, we're we gonna probably move... made it way too complicated. Oh yeah, man, yeah. way too much. But guys, I, I hope any, I hope this rings true with a lot of you guys, right. or you find something in here that adds that little, I would say, nugget of of, yeah. of help for you in in your making a simplistic story. Believe it or not, when we were talking about this podcast, right, mm -hmm. this whole idea of simplicity, I was like, Caleb, we could make this not just about simplicity in storytelling. We could make it about simplicity in just life in general. It applies to so many things. And he's like, Jacob, wouldn't that be making this a bit complicated? It's like, yes, that is true. <laughs> but yeah, simplicity See, we is romanticize incredible. it. We romanticize yeah. complexity. Mm -hmm. But guys, uh, we're going to move over into the Q&A section yes. of the podcast right here. So Jacob, what can they do to get their questions answered? Yes. Yeah, so if you want to get your questions answered, okay, because there were a lot of questions for this one. We, like, we had cut out a lot of them. There, yes, that's because true. Because there, there were a lot of questions. Um, ask your questions in the comment section of this podcast, and we'll try and get to them in the next one. Yep. First question is from Lex the Graceful Rival. Oh, Love boy. your questions. <laughs> They're fantastic. Oh, today in Fix That Anime, the fan favorite segment of the podcast, Jacob. Jacob and Caleb will be fixing an anime that's unanimously beloved by the anime community, held, but, held up as the best in its genre, known for its amazing protagonist, Sword Art Online. Oh, oh boy. Oh, wonderful. Uh, no, okay. Actually, I think this is very topical for this, right now. This is quite because, topical. Because simplicity. Simplicity, yeah. yeah. That's how they basically could have made this much better. Because yep. when I think about the first three episodes of Sword Art Online, they're, they're pretty great. good. They're pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Not, like, that's something where I would definitely want to see more of it. Yep. And then it kind of like changed what it was about and, you know, got a bit more complicated with things than I felt like they needed to when they had a very simple, compelling, nice premise with great, you know, aesthetics, music, visuals. Yeah, they hadn't stuff. needed to go deep into the characters yet right. because well, they were just well, still introducing the story. But even in those first three episodes, that was probably where we got some of the most depth for the characters as far as establishing them and stuff. And like there, there was there was good meat there, you know, and then most of the people that seem to rag on Sword Online the Line is because they're like, well, okay, yeah, th th that was great. Those first three episodes were great. Why didn't we get more of that? Yep. You know, wh so, what happened? So look at what happened in the first three episodes. Mm -hmm. Take things around yep. the, I would say, the the simple core cast of characters that end up partying together. Maybe you don't have everyone split up and stuff. Maybe you focus on more of a collaboration right. of keeping everyone in the same place. Keep it scary of, you know, the whole thing of, like, people will die in right. this game. And have there that. be the emotional, you know. like... You know, just and consequences. Yeah, that whole thing, that. Yeah. and actually have the characters feel things. Well, I, yeah. specifically the main character, right? But, but and then just make it be about okay, them trying to survive together, just survive, and then they yeah. end up they they end up surviving. All right, they made it out, they're home free. All right, and then you know that 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 could be the end of it. We wouldn't need to have court two, <laughs> but um, and then if they did, they could figure out a way maybe to do it along the same sure. style. But yeah, yeah. Uh, Mikey asks, "Do you guys think you would still love reacting to shows, say, ten to fifteen years from now?" I don't know. I think we will still love watching anime yeah. and talking about anime like, till I die. So yeah, if we were to so go, yes. I feel like the only way to really check what things would be like ten to fifteen years from now is to look ten to fifteen years ago, and then use that as a sort of measurement. Mm -hmm. And um, Ten to fifteen, yeah, I would have no way of making any sort of statements about that far in the future. Yeah, if one of yeah. you for some reason couldn't be in videos anymore, would the other still move forward with the channel? <laughs> I think that would be likely. I think yeah. it would. It would I probably th change. How I think it would change things, because 
because I, I benefit a lot personally from having the ability to discuss with someone. Oh yeah, right here. yeah, me too. I, the the idea of like, okay, people that do like discussion type videos and stuff by themselves, that's like that's wow. scary. How that's, do they do that's that? That's scary. I I don't know how they do it because like that's. Oof. 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 All right, Moonstone yeah. Pearl asks, which God Hand member from Berserk do you think has the coolest design? This well, is an easy obviously, one, right? obviously, Mr. Brain. Yeah, 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 big brain. You know. Big yeah. brain with his 80s right. design with the, the bat yeah, drop just like thing and the, okay, the exposed, but, yeah. Because oh, for the so other greedy. three, the, the, you know, Medusa, the Medusa one. She's cool. She has a pretty cool design, but it's also one of those things where it's like, okay, how much of it is a design for the character rather than, like, basically a, a fan service design? Like, if yeah, that we makes don't sense. Know. I think um, Femtoes is decent. It's a little bit simple. I would say sure. that that's I would say that's probably my second favorite. Uh -huh. Femtoes yeah. is is uh is good. I think it's just that he didn't speak. Well, right. And yeah, that and, I think is I mean, biasing a little bit of my thoughts of the design. Well, sure. And we didn't see him that long and we didn't that's like true. him ever seen. But um and then yeah. for the other two, I I would get them confused. Yeah, like, me too. Like, me too, like, straight up. Switch? There's you know, the really small one, and then there's the kind of smaller one. Yeah, they're yeah. both bald ones with weird eyes that don't really have much of oh, a Oh, I thought body, they were glasses. You know? <laughs> well, oh yeah, one of them has glasses, I think. But, <laughs> but yeah. 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 Uh, Lex the Graceful Rival asked another question. If you could design your own MHA character to add into the anime, what would be their quirk, their backstory, their design, their motivation, their ideals? Oh my gosh, so okay. much. Um, okay. um, let's just hack yeah. me a character yeah. really okay. quick. All right. So, Girl. Ultimate Frisbee. Okay, Ultimate Frisbee, awesome. Yeah. So, so there'd be a quirk related to discs that they would like generate out of their hands or their skin okay, or yeah. something and they would like fling them like cool. like dirt dust like all right so spinning things. so they basically want to use their quirk to basically um in this is a weird kind of hero sense because it's not really a hero but they uh they basically want to use it to be like a like a sports performer like there could be oh, a whole okay. realm of sports related based sure. on like quirk usage yeah stuff. how does sports and quirks Relegate. Come on. Yeah. MHA. Yeah. World building. Let's do this. Um, so then they have the sort of Hinata backstory of like, you know, the underdog that wants to do all this stuff. Yeah. And, I, I could um, see also the backstory tying in that their quirk is something that uh, it's more heteromorphic. It's, it's on them. Sure. But it also comes off of them, which is maybe something that uh, they were kind of a hassle to deal with with their quirk just a little bit because they were just constantly leaving crap everywhere. Sure. Um, yeah, that could be kind of interesting. Uh, their motivation, I, I would say that they're kind of a, a performer. The very yeah, best. yeah, very simple, very simple. Yeah. Just ideal to be the best at simple. something. Yeah. Uh, I would say they Fashion love to run, so I'm kind of self-inserting a character in here. Right. Um, but yeah, 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 yeah. passion, sure. We no basically catalyst uh, is Jabok and Kaylun robot. We know not the answer. Error, 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 <laughs> error, 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 four error, page error, 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 error. <laughs> 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 Tanya the Future Writer asks, how would you properly write a large cast of characters and give each of them their own story arcs? Oh, keep it simple. Uh, so, yes. so, okay, yes. okay, so what I would do, what I would do is you're thinking about this wrong. Think about how to write one character with a story arc. Multiple right? times. And and get good at get good <laughs> at writing <laughs> one character with a story arc, right? <laughs> and then and then do that multiple times in the same story. Yeah, I, I think like, that I think that one of the things that I, I love doing is just spamming out characters. So mm -hmm. what I'll do is I'll approach it from the standpoint of I'm not invested in any of these characters. I will then give them each caricature stick shticks. Just just build them foundationally mm -hmm. from the get go, and then take those shticks and build just a little addendum thing onto them. Right. Yeah. And the thing is, is that having a large cast of characters and giving them each story arcs, you can have a shtick caricature character go on a story arc yeah. and have it last like a very small amount of time. Or the reverse. Or, could, okay, yeah. Like, here's another thing to think about. <laughs> yeah, go for it. A lot of characters in stories, if you were to look at them, they actually basically are a shtick character mm -hmm. that got set up with a very simple arc yep. of development yep. that ends up going over a fair amount of time. Yes, and because and of there's this, like they're all like segmented out right, very exactly. far apart from each other. And and usually with these characters, the reason that you don't think of them as caricatures and just archetypes, shticks and tropes and all that stuff is because they spend the proper amount of time with them for you to be able to connect with them yes. and see how they are. Well said. Even if they might start out as a caricature and all that, they become a specific character that is that caricature. Sokka from Avatar The Last Airbender is a great example of that. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a more or less shtick character that 
goes with very segmented, spaced out oh, yeah. development episodes. And then as of the whole, you're like, wow, Sokka developed a lot. It's like, uh-huh. well, actually, he yeah. made little jumps mm-hmm. over a large period of time. Another one that I would say from Avatar is Katara. Oh, if you, sure. Like, if you think about it, mm-hmm. at the beginning, she was kind of the shtick female character in the cast, right? Because, like, you know, this was made back in 2005. There weren't there weren't as many good female characters back then. Yeah. But And if you look at the, the arc and development, now, over the course of the story, you're like, no, this is a great character, right? Mm. But started out very, very simple, and the overall development, even if you were to just look at book one, very simple. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Fuyo Hanabi asks, you guys each pick one. Become a stand user, become a Jedi, become a Nen user, become a hero with a quirk, become a Titan shifter, become a great teacher, <laughs> become a volleyball player. Jedi. Uh, yeah, see. No contest. The thing is, Jedi has access to multiple powers. Right. The only one of these that seems more interesting than that is, I would say in some ways, you're going to laugh, but a volleyball player. Because... Because I can actually get like, like, like. There's no limits to how good of a volleyball player I could be. Especially not if you're a Jedi. Yes, I guess you're right. Yeah, I mean, Jedi would be the <laughs> best. I'm sorry, it's it's a Jedi. Yeah, yeah. Grim. I was trying to. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, but yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh-huh. Grim Snowy asks, "What was one scene from an anime that made you ball out your eyes?" You go what first. One anime. Uh, uh, I have a ton of these. Uh, or I can go first if you want. I could just die. Yeah. Episode oh. is it episode three or four? It's episode three. Episode three from a place for the universe. Yeah, yeah, that was. Oh man, hey, hey, that hey, was really hey, good. Character shtick archetype with simple arc. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Freaking story, Yori. It's so yeah. good. Yeah. What was um, yours? Uh, for me. Most of a silent voice, but um, <laughs> yes. but specifically the part where the, and this this is what just destroyed me when um uh, the the background song was LVS. They just used three letter uh, terminology to denote the songs. But when basically uh, Shoya comes in, and of course he hates Shoko at this point, and he sees her messing around at his desk. Mm, yeah, and they start fighting. Yeah, and Shoko Ugh. actually fights back this time, mm-hmm. and you get the feeling you know what's going on, but you yeah. find out for sure later that she was cleaning his desk with all yeah. the you know go kill yourself and all that stuff <laughs> that his previous friends were writing on there. But he yeah. of course doesn't know that and doesn't think that, and they end up just fighting, and it's awful, and it's so sad, and it rips your heart out, and then squashes it on the watch floor, a and burns it, and watch a silent voice, watch a silent voice, watch a silent voice, watch it, watch it, yeah. watch it, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Next question is from Jason South. Will this podcast ever be on iTunes as an audio podcast? Probably. I don't know. It's going to Twitch. It might have to be put on iTunes just by the nature of like, yeah, why not? Uh, Jess asks, or Jess5 asks, uh, Jacob, for your book, uh, did you have a certain reader demographic in mind when writing it? Yes. So um, it is definitely a young adult story. Okay. But the thing is, is that when I started this, basically the idea that I wanted to have for it is I wanted it to be something that basically redeems young adult as a genre. Because when I would oh, go so ambitious, <laughs> yeah, yeah, or or at least plays its part. Because I like that was what I would read growing up, and I loved right. it. I loved it. Maybe some of them weren't young adult, but and then when I would go into bookstores and I'd look for more young adult, I would look at what was there, and maybe it was actually good, but just from judging the books by their covers, um, it all looked like crap. So I was like, okay. This needs to be fixed, yeah. and I'll do my part with you know making a young adult book yeah. that that people of all ages could read and appreciate. Cool. Uh, TB asks, uh, I'm currently in a Bakugo S state of emotions. I'm going to start 11th grade, and I've always been the smart kid who got really good marks and reads a lot. This time I got really low marks, and I did not find comfort in stories. In fact, it gets worse because I end up comparing myself to characters and feeling like crap. I do not have any accomplishments and feel like I'm just experiencing a down spiral. I do not have any friends, and when I tried opening up to my family, they ended up using my emotions against me. Also, they have no faith in me and feel like they have been wasting money on me, especially since I have not had a violin exam for three years. I do not have a positive relationship with my parents and siblings, and they keep insulting me, and since I am used to staying at home, I don't know how to get out. Do you have any advice on how I can get myself out of this emotional crisis? This is very personal to me, but I honestly trust you more than anyone in my life, especially since your videos have made a great comfort to me. TB, I am so sorry you're going through this situation. Yeah. My my heart goes out to you. I I I feel 
I I I feel you here. Like mm-hmm. I, I it's it's breaking my heart right here. Um I I totally resonate with where um uh, you kind of feel powerless in this situation because you're in 11th grade and you're mm-hmm. not you're not fully yeah. independent yet and there's a lot of there's a lot of specific factors in here that come all into play and they mm-hmm. kind of compound on each other. So I just want to I just want to let you know that I, I understand what you're going through. Um, to, to the most part, thank you for being so mm-hmm. open and vulnerable yeah. here. I, I just want to say I, I'm proud of you. I, I want to say that I, I, I believe in you. And I know it's really hard when uh, it, it seems like no one really believes in you and stuff. But I think that you can take comfort in knowing that there's someone out there, even if it's not us, but there's someone out there that you know that probably believes in you. And maybe they don't say it specifically, but as for like specific advice, I think specifically with the emotional side of things, it's really, really difficult to help yourself in this case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that acknowledging that you can't do this alone is is the hardest step but it's the most important yeah, that, one that's pretty much what i was gonna and, say and too. the and the worst thing about this is that you you feel like you can't go to the specific mm-hmm. close people in your life that right. should, you should be, be able, able to, to, go, to. to yeah. go to and help you out with this mm-hmm. so um yeah yeah i i would say i would say for for now be 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 careful and guard your heart but also take take little risks here and there if you can mm. to open up to people that you haven't opened up to yet right. uh, that are close to you. If you if you don't have any friends, I see it says you do not have any friends when you try to opening up to family, they be using emotions against me. I don't know what your family situation is, right. but if you have like other family that you haven't yeah, talked like to yet, like cousins, cousins, or, grandparents, uh-huh. preferably someone that's uh, a little bit older. I I don't right. have any negative thoughts towards someone younger helping you, but I, I feel like generally someone that's older mm-hmm. is going to have a little bit more um, just just yeah. wisdom and experience yeah. to share here. Right. I, I can say personally that I went through a lot of depression when I was around your age, and the thing that helped me the most was I had to, this is kind of a, a weird way to say this, but I had to actively rewire my brain over the course of like a year to be just someone that people desired to be around. And this didn't solve the depression thing, let me tell you, it didn't solve it. But what ended up happening was, is people were then willing to then accept and receive me in my vulnerable states. So I would then be more vulnerable Mm -hmm. with them and just let them know, hey, I I need someone just to be here right now. And that's that's something that takes time. So I, I would say, I, I, I don't have any like detailed specific advice. It's more like yeah. general principles and then a lot of encouragement. Mm-hmm. I, I think that um, uh, there's a couple kind of, uh, there's a couple kind of things that you can do with regards to seeking out encouragement without, I, I would say, not that, not that you're doing this, but there's ways that people perceive and they will end up kind of moving away intentionally. Uh, I don't know how to say this, but but yeah. you you know what I'm saying is basically trying kind to, of yeah trying we, to seek out encouragement specifically right because so that it builds you up and then you can mm-hmm. end up getting at least enough of a kickstart that you can start the ball rolling to finding exactly. the people that will then help you yeah. to solve this yep because because that's that's the biggest the biggest thing from all this if we were you know to make this be a simple answer mm-hmm. you know is uh, don't try to do this alone. Yeah, don't try to and, do this alone. And, but and, if you, and you've said that you you don't feel like you have anybody. Do you know? Try and find somebody that that you can you can right. be open with them on this, and and you know they they can they can support you in the same way that you know they know you'd support them if the situation was reversed, kind of a thing. Right. Basically, um, you you have a you have a you have a need. And that need is valid. There is nothing yeah. invalid yep. about yep. your need. So build your life now from the from the ground up, like throw everything else away that doesn't basically move you in a direction to getting that need met. This is very mechanical. Um, but, but I have I have yeah. I I have no way of basically giving you the the specific advice right. that would help you in this case, other than like there's some really like just helpful simple tools like don't don't let your sleep suffer. Like yeah, I, I would uh-huh. say, like here's some very basic things: is like 
keep making sure that you're 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 eating well make sure that you're mm-hmm. you're you're getting to bed on time don't don't stay up super late right. um like you know talk to like talk to the wall if you have to but make uh-huh. sure if you if you feel like you're a person that needs to talk your feelings out find some place to do it i'll tell you that there are many many a times when i would just go on walks early in the morning and just talk to myself. Mm-hmm. And yep. sometimes it's good to feel like you're you're talking to someone, but like even if it just feels like you're talking to your your inner self mm-hmm. or what have you, that's something that really yeah. helps a lot. Um, the other thing I would say is mm-hmm. keep your self talk positive. Yes, because because yes. this is because you know we well don't really said. know what your situation is. Like we can we can gather what we can from this, but but this is rough, mm-hmm. right? you don't need it to you don't need to be surrounded on both sides like like yeah. it, you know if you've got all this stuff on the outside then then your your best bet is to make it so that you don't have to worry about the inside right yeah so you know whether it's whether it's talking to people you know just going on walks and you know and talking to yourself um or or listening to like positive positive stuff on youtube or you know or whatever like like whatever right mm-hmm. um Anything that basically helps keep your 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 mind, emotion, spirit, all that stuff in a good place, mm-hmm. do that. Yeah, um, I, I think that this is something yeah. that, uh, on some level, the easiest solution is you find someone that can help you. Mm-hmm. Assuming you don't, I think YouTube is actually a pretty good source for getting just general encouragement. Yeah, and if the if the main thing going on with you right now is you feel like you're in a state of emotional crisis is like get get real with yourself and figure out like wait what what specific emotions am i dealing with right now and then go go like to youtube for instance and look up videos that are all about like you know encouraging those specific areas and right. uh, you know about positive reinforcement internally with those kinds of things one other thing i would say and and this might be something that you should just you know throw out but if it's not i, I want to make sure i, I, I say it Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times I know I have gotten anxious and basically seen people as having opinions about me that they didn't have. Oh, yeah. Right? So, so if, you know, I would basically try and double check all these things that you, you think about your, your family, you know, because those are the people that you really do want to be able to go to. So... If you already are sure that yes, this is this is the situation that I'm dealing with, then then completely throw this out. But if if you're not entirely sure, then double check because one of the worst things I would think is to have family members that would potentially be up for listening to you and you know and helping you with this um, and thinking you can't go to them. So right. um, yeah. yeah, the the worst thing about people is generally like the fact that they're people. And this right. is something that yeah. I had to deal with a lot was I put expectations on people to be perfect. And this is something I don't think you're necessarily doing. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that helped me a lot was realizing that just like me, like as a very flawed individual, that's everyone. That's nothing yeah. special. Everyone is yeah. flawed in some way. So when people do things that hurt me or ab- abuse my my trust in them or the connection mm-hmm. in them, I don't. I don't hold it against them. I, I I have to let it go as quick as possible. Yeah. Now this is something I feel like comes from uh, just just experience. It's not necessarily something that I think works in every situation, but especially when it comes to emotional um, situations like this, and it's not something where you know there's like physical or like some kind of like violation of like you as a person. It's more just kind of em- emotional based stuff. Is forgive quickly like forgive really mm-hmm. quickly yeah. because one of the worst yeah. the worst emotions to be dealing with is bitterness mm-hmm. because it it's unfortunately something that leads to other things right. and I, yeah. I I just say as someone who's, who's dealt with kind of a whole gamut of things that seem very similar to what you could be going through um, getting one person that was just willing to be there mm-hmm. helped so much yeah and then then going through with things on my own with what my emotions were mm-hmm. uh just helped me become a more rounded person and i would just say that like think 
think like excited about this because this is a journey that I think most people don't get to go on, which is the journey of understanding your emotions. And in some ways, in some ways I would say like, uh, getting mastery over them. Now, this is something that's going to come way in the future. But I have, I have, I have, I have confidence in you. So think about it this way: at some point, someone's going to come to you with issues in this area, and you'll have solved them, and you'll be on the other side right. of them, yeah. and you'll be able to help them in the same way yep. that you figured out how to help yourself or someone else helped you. In, so, yeah. so I, I, I believe in you. Uh, yeah, yeah, me too. And if I could give you one proverb, it would be like you know sort of little wise saying or whatever that has helped me a lot it's what you focus on you find yeah what you focus on grows what you focus on seems real what you focus on you ultimately become mm -hmm. that is both a potentially very amazing thing and a very sobering thing mm -hmm. so all these things that we say of trying to help keep your internals in a good place yeah. right finding good wholesome things to focus on and stuff mm -hmm. That's because of this, because yeah. the, the the reason bitterness can can just suck so much is because it gets you to focus on the negative. Yeah. And then that all sorts of bad stuff can happen from that. So, yeah, yeah. TB, I don't know if you're on our discord or anything, but if you are, reach out to us. Yeah. Um, you, there's yeah. no pressure to join or anything like mm -hmm. that. But I, I am wishing you all the best. We love you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or girl. Stay, stay strong. Know. Yeah. Antonio Roja Cortez asks, if movie directors, television writers, or anime studios were able to cover other movies or shows like musicians cover songs, what would you like to see? Whoa, Ooh. I would love to see Guillermo del Toro do some do more just anime related stuff because he's a okay. self-proclaimed anime enthusiast and sure. he has wanted to do uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion for a long time. <laughs> And if we got a live action NGE, that would be that would be so sick. Like, if it was like done by, right by by an actual fan is the thing. Well, that's you know? that's like, that would be Gil yeah. Guillermo del Toro. Uh -huh. like, right, that, right, exactly. That would be what so, I would like to see. Okay, yeah. I could definitely see it not only working but being really good because of how good uh, the first Pacific Rim was. So this is this is very specific, but I would love to see Kyoto Annie mm -hmm. basically. And this is mainly, I think, because of having watched a bit of Violet Evergarden. Mm -hmm. I want to see them do covers of sorts of traditional stories, like Jane Austen. Oh, like like Kyoto oh, yeah. Annie doing a Pride and Prejudice. I think that would be amazing. Yeah, and it's like, a public domain, so they could. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. So there you go. And they'd make it real pretty. <laughs> they would. Steel Ram asks, "What's the most memorable D and D campaign you ever had?" Ooh. Well, uh, I have never finished a D and D campaign, but I mean, like it could be like a Star Wars. Campaign, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Well, I end up designing a campaign a while back <laughs> that, and it's not the one you're thinking of. Actually, oh. it was the planet. Oh, that one was a lot of fun. So I designed yeah. one where basically I needed a way for an open world setting with no real rules with regards mm -hmm. to Star Wars. So I told basically the party. Which was they, me and my cousin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, but the point is I told them that you're going to be going on an expedition to an unknown planet for riches, exploration, and all the above. And you're going with a massive people, on, massive group of people on a massive ship. So, you know, get go there with the expectancy of nothing. Like, you have no idea what's coming. Mm -hmm. And it and it played out a lot like Lost in some ways. Oh, it was great! Yeah. And I had so much fun. It was making a lot it. of fun. Like, yeah, because it had this cool like survival aspect to it, where it's like we need to get our gear back, we need to you know do all this stuff, set up a base, set up a camp. You know, mm -hmm. it was it was wonderful. And the fact that there were only like two players made it, it made for a really interesting dynamic. Um, but my favorite would be again Star Wars, but we called it the Sith Acolyte Dropout Campaign mm -hmm. or the Sad mm -hmm. Campaign. And basically, we were all. <laughs> Sith Acolytes mm -hmm. on Korriban. Yep. But the thing is, we all sucked for one reason or other. We were very good. Like, like yes, we were, very we strong. were all, like, powerful in our own way. But, but they were problem students. But we were problem students that for some reason had a fatal flaw to the point that the Sith would much rather just, just kill us, kill us yep. and have just be done with us, right? Yep. Um, and it was it was Hijinks, in, hijinks ensued yeah, it and was, craziness <laughs> abounded. And the story was very short and very ridiculous. Yeah, very comedy centric and all that stuff, mm -hmm. and just just good fun. But oh man, it was great. But yeah, it they, was they enjoyed so it. Much fun. I, I was the DM for that one. That one that was really cool. 
Uh, Sano uh, Ogino asks, do you have any favorite childhood shows or movies or books or whatever that you loved but now realize was complete trash once you got older? Um, um, complete trash, I would say, is a trash. bit harsh. Yeah, I don't but know specifically anything like that. Yeah, I mean, like, okay, oh, Bleach, Bleach wasn't as good as... That's we, not childhood, like, though. Yeah, okay, um, Aragon? Aragon wasn't childhood again. Uh, that was pretty close. That's a, or oh, for, me, oh for a book. For a yeah. book. Okay. Like yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm four years younger than you. So that's true. So childhood that's true. is a little bit different. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think one of the things that I really really loved was I really loved. Um, oh shoot. Uh, what was it called? Dang. It. I'll, I'll think oh, of something uh, else. Redwall. No, Redwall is great. Redwall okay. is Redwall is actually amazing. That 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 stuff was that stuff was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't really know. I think there's nothing that was complete trash, but oh. maybe something where I was kind of surprised by like how bad it was. Uh huh. Um, even though I thought it was like the best thing ever. So you guys right. remember Magic School Bus? Oh, Magic, Magic School, School Bus, Bus is actually amazing. But the thing is, I thought it was actually the best thing ever. So when I went and mm-hmm. re back and rewatched some of it, I'm like, oh, oof. This is this is children's storytelling. This is yeah. children's programming for children, and it was it was a very rude awakening. Here's here's but I mine. still like it in some Here, ways. Here's mine, and so Balto, the Disney movie. Oh, so when I was sick one day, I watched Balto five times in a row. Oh my gosh, I loved that movie. I love wolves in general. It's you know? a weird so, film if you go and analyze it. But like, it is weird. But it's pretty weird. And as far as Disney films go, it's not one of their best. No. Um, but but I just I loved that movie as a kid. But then going back, it's like okay. There's a really good nostalgia critic video on oh, yeah? Balto that you would, oh, you would really like. That. Yeah. Uh, William McMeekin asks, so the last Airbender live action was announced and everyone is putting in their two cents on how to make it as good as the cartoon, but what I want to ask is how, is what could they do to make it surpass the original? Okay, 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 okay. You're talking my language. All right. I am hyped to the umpteenth degree about this because guys, <laughs> this is the thing. This is the thing. Everyone's like, oh no, another Netflix live action. But the thing is every single other one that did a, a, a live action adaptation utilize the original people that created it as like a the most lowest creative consultant person ever Uh and the people helming it like the directors and all that were a completely different group of people this is mike dimartino and brian konitsko at the front of it yeah bright is back (laughs) guys bright is back like let me just like Uh uh-huh meme review and and, bright is back (laughs) and here's the other thing too one of the biggest ways, okay, two two things that I think would make it potentially surpass the original, or at least live up to it, and and living up to it, you know how much we love that. Living oh, up yeah. to it, that is a big deal. Big deal is simplicity, like we talked mm-hmm. about in this podcast, because yep. that's one of the big things that the original series had going for it. Mm-hmm. And two, that is basically that the reason Avatar: The Last Airbender is such a big deal for us, mm-hmm. right? And the reason why even if it was an amazing show, it wouldn't be able to live up to it, is because it's new, right? It's not, it doesn't have the nostalgia, nostalgia factor. Value. Yeah. Right, because that's huge. And while, huge. and while that doesn't make it like objectively just not a great show, that is something that can't be ignored, right? Yes. Th- because that, that exists. There's so, a reason that that's there. But let's get mechanical here. Let's How to me- per- surpass the mm-hmm. original? Here's the simplest one. There's gonna be more of it. Yeah. It's going to be longer. Yeah. Now, yeah. this is not guaranteed. This is not uh, guaranteed. Right, but right, depending on how they format this, mm-hmm. they can add more characterization. Yep. They can add more character development. They can just have simply better dialogue. This is the other thing. They can remove the great divide. <laughs> they can remove the great divide. Like, <laughs> guys, let's let's be real here. Like, like it, it, no, let's just keep flying. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Or they could fix it. Like, yeah. Holy have crap. Zuko chase them in there. Like... <gasps> You know, like because because more Zuko too. Yeah, yeah, more like, Zuko, more Iroh. Like, come on. Yeah, like, yeah. We could have mini subplot flashbacks mm-hmm. of Iroh going into the spirit yeah. world. Let's make us actually care about Katara's over emotional speeches about hope. They get better as the show goes on, but like, but let's make sure that like each one really, really is felt. Oh, wait, Jacob, you're right. What? But that just blew my mind. Not they're not gonna make it longer. They're gonna make it shorter. 
Guys, this is this is this is actually the brilliance Ooh. of it. Remember how when the movie came out in 2010, we were like, "Oh, cool, book one." But how probably, are they going to condense it? But yeah. I know, but book one was probably the least liked of all the books of Avatar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> because it just didn't have as much going for it. There I would say no in, talk, for some know? for some people, I think book three was their least liked. For some people. But for the majority of people, book one was the least like because there was a lot of episodes that could have be just removed. If they do a show version of book one as a whole season and they do it in, say, you know, 12 episodes, mm -hmm. you could do that. Sure. You could do that. Well, there's also the fact of like, how long, how long are, are these episodes, episodes going to be? Yeah. Because I get yeah. the feeling like they're they're not going to be 20 minutes. The other thing that they could do mm -hmm. is they could, this is, this is one that might touch people's nostalgia, things uh -huh. a little bit is Netflix designed it with the anime 23 minutes learn a child's lesson and then re you know start the episode into the next one there were very few linear episode oh. plots so they could make they it could a like, linear story can, so okay and blend all the episodes together for that Netflix binging uh -huh. style well, and, and then you just make it even more bingeable and you just and then book one's here's done. another thing what if they daredeviled it and basically and Daredevil wasn't the only one that did, but explain, basically, explain. What if they turned it into eight hour long episodes? Yes, I know. Like, like, we don't like, know what the like episode they, format's they, gonna they can, be. They could do it any way they want. And Ugh. like, oh man, oh it like. Mm -hmm. There's a this lot. Could be so there's a lot of so things good. that I think people are really scared about, and the big one I think is the bending, um, right. with regards mm -hmm. to uh, money yeah. and all those other things. But I exactly. think if you actually look back at 2010, the main problem with that movie was nothing related to the bending. Right. It was basically like some technicalities of like, firebenders don't need a source, or why are their movements not in correlation? I'm talking about the CGI of the bending. Uh -huh. Right, right. But imagine if you have 2018 Netflix yeah. money in your bending. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I think I think the one bending style that will probably be the weirdest is air because you can't see it technically. Oh, you don't? You don't I think, think it'd be like Earth or something? No, no, no. I could see Earth being very, very easy to, oh, okay. to, do, to do properly. I, I just the, the main thing that I think about with Earth is like actually like taking chunks out of the ground and things like that. Like, like I, I just hope that looks really good and, and it's actually like like motions and like jerky and like not not like fluid and stuff like the crap that was. Well, anyways, we'll not talk about the movie. Okay, cool. But, but yes, um, yeah. Um, I'm hopeful. I think that uh, the main thing we have going for it is that it's a lot of the same people. Right. So so they'll just keep things simple. And, and it's just... Netflix, which means less um, Nickelodeon higher ups getting into everyone's butts and puppeteering right. people to make things a certain way. Although we could. OK, here's one of the other reasons. All right. We could get Cabbage Merchant again. Oh, my gosh. Live action Cabbage Man. Think about that for a second. That could be wonderful. That could be that cringy. Could be so beautiful. That could be pretty cringy. It could be cringy, but it could All also right. be ne amazing. Next, next question. Suck a Ponch asks, mm. weird question, but is the channel your main source of income or do you have work offline? If you do, then how do you balance between work and being active in the community? Plus, if you used to have a job before starting the channel, could you share with us what it was? Well, um, the simple so, answer is yes. This is our main source of mm -hmm. income because you guys are super generous yeah. on Patreon. Uh -huh. And uh, Patreon is one of the best means for any kind of creative mm -hmm. uh, person to yeah. make a stable income uh, via yeah. the internet. I would say ad revenue is far too inconsistent. Yep. And people are not really ready to admit that yet. Mm -hmm. But... Um, <laughs> And if you okay. want advice on how to make your Patreon maybe be more successful, keep it simple. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, it says, if you do, how do you balance between work and being active in the community? The closest thing for that, for me, would be just with the book. And that, I mean, that's tough. Like, Caleb yeah. was a lot more active on the Discord than me because, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say we, we manage it pretty well. But it's basically just about uh, focusing on the priorities. And then if you mm -hmm. have leftover time, uh, you can add back to those specific areas you feel exactly. like we're not focused on enough. Right. Um, this is plus if you need to have a plus if you used to have a job before starting the channel, could you share with us what it was? So, well, the first real job I oh, so the most recent real job right. I had before the channel was I was a property manager, and yeah. that's basically like a glorified uh, relational business accountant, <laughs> and that's the gist of it. 
Um, but the thing is, I've been into kind of entrepreneurial stuff ever since I was 24. Since I well, since I was probably like 22. But mm-hmm. when I turned 24, I became like pretty pretty financially independent to where I had some uh, yeah uh, basically some recurring residuals mm-hmm. and was able to go from that to focusing on specific you know specific things and youtube just ended up being one of the right. things that i focused that on. was that was pretty much what i did too more or less not that not the the property management thing i was i was working at like chipotle and like emerald city smoothie and stuff and basically mm-hmm. just like stockpiling money away to work on the book right because the, the whole dream was to be able to leave that behind work on the book full time and everything yep. and when i ended up going to do that then we also ended up doing the youtube channel so mm-hmm. then it just sort of turned into this thing that worked out really well and right. that was actually one of the things that helped us grow a lot because we were able to actually put in a lot of time into the channel because we had already prepared for something like this yeah i, I would say a lot of the a lot of the a lot of the success that comes from doing an endeavor like this there's a lot of preparation that you don't generally see mm-hmm. that's done way before the yeah. actual starting of the uh, right. effort takes place and we were able to do that yeah uh, Graham Specter asks, what's the most positively surprising show or story you've experienced? Something you didn't have high expectations for or thought was going to be bad, but you ended up liking? Okay, that's that's basically the story of this channel for me, yeah. specifically. <laughs> MHA, I didn't think I was going to like it that much. Yeah. JoJo's, I didn't think I was going to like it that much. Haikyuu, I didn't think I was going to like it that much. Yeah. Uh, uh, a Place for the Universe, I didn't think I was going to like it that much. <gasps> Like, no, literally, like, I thought it was going to be just kind of a slice of life, just oh, cutesy man. stuff, but I I'm way more it. optimistic about shows than Caleb is. Okay, but the thing is, I've become way more optimistic over time. Yes. That's yes. the point, is that um, a lot of the shows I've always been kind of surprised by because you guys just recommend such good stuff for us. Like, Great Teacher Onizuka. I did not think I would love it this much. Yeah. An example of one where I knew I was going to like it no matter what was uh, Monster. I, oh. I knew that mm-hmm. before even getting to the show, I was like, yep, this is my show. This is my jam. I'm gonna love it. I wasn't surprised. It was amazing. I love it. I still love it. It's 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 amazing. Um, yeah. But I, I would say it's it's a difference between having high expectations and having like regular expectations. Uh. There are a lot of shows like Soriyori, you know, Place for the Universe, yeah. that I just had regular expectations for. I'm like, okay, this is gonna be decent. Yeah. But uh, uh, no, the- I ended up loving it. So like one of my favorite shows of yeah. this year. Like it's it's a fantastic show. Yeah, for me, um, one of the big ones that came to mind was the uh, well, okay, after the last Airbender, actually, oh, this guy was when. telling me about it, and, yes. like, and I, I was like cartoons that's for kids i'm like you will watch it yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i ended up watching it and of course i loved it and it was amazing um the the <laughs> avatar movie that was another one i don't like it as much now but like i thought it was just gonna be stupid because the trailer was awful and then i ended up watching it blue people yeah yeah oh yeah. And god I was, okay. and i was and i was blown away <sighs> by it <sighs> yeah no 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 not, not the no 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 <laughs> The, what Avatar? What Airbender? I was about movie? to that like in the name of the Father and like yeah, yeah. banish you. From yeah, yeah. <laughs> Deus Volt, Deus Volt in yeah. <laughs> Um And then uh, Torador was the other big one because I had no expectations really. I'd heard about it and I was like, I'll try this out. You know? Oh yes, see if it's same fun. here. Torador. Oh I did yeah, not yeah. Think. Yeah, you you are like no romance I be, slice of life. I used life, to be really pessimistic. Anime. Oh yeah, yeah. And, uh, and but it was amazing. And five and years ago, so Caleb much. was yeah. not a very it was so person. hard to get this guy into anime. Yeah. Like, it was so hard. I'd watch Death Note, and that's about it. Yeah. And, and you were salty and we didn't you talk about Bleach. Bleach. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. don't need to talk about Bleach. <laughs> don't need to talk about that. Uh, that was yeah. painful. But that's the last of the questions. That's the last of the questions, there guys. Thank you so much for asking your questions. Thank yep. you so much for watching all the way to the end mm-hmm. of this video. Uh, if you want to leave questions, they'll be answered in the next podcast. Leave them in the comments down below, and we'll get right to them. So yeah, we'll see you in the next one. But until then, for Semblance of Sanity, I'm Caleb. I'm Jacob. And we'll see you all next time. time.